welcome to another episode of Budget Podcast. My name is Nancy Odimegu. I'm your host. Good to have you join us on this episode. So for today's episode here, we'll be discussing the COVID-19 Transparency and Accountability Project, that's CETA. And joining me in the conversation today is Usayo Murakenio. He is the Community Engagement Director for the Connected Development Code. And we equally have Ian Olua Bularingwa, the Senior Programs Officer with Budget. Good to have you join us, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much, Nancy. We'll be having an assessment of government response to COVID-19 and the intervention fund that were disbursed. Let's start with Chief Usayo. Could you give us an overview of what the COVID-19 Transparency and Accountability Project CTAP is all about? You know, what bettered this particular initiative and the objectives behind this project? Yeah, great. Um, thanks once again for having, having us. I think this the, the CTAP project was born out of a necessity, um, the necessity to drive a constructive conversation around physical transparency on the funds that we knew was going to be coming into the country or the country was going to mark to spend for this health emergency. I mean, every government um, intervention um, in Nigeria comes with a certain level of um, irregularities. And we, we probably felt that taking a cue from the 2012 flood and taking a cue from our experience working with the Nigerian government especially around issues of procurement, um, emergencies, and um, the general fear of the government's inability to clearly, for the lack of a better word, um, be transparent and open its books for citizens to follow up on how their funds have been expended. We, we decided to come up with um, this, this tracking, um, which, was, which was quite deliberate. And this time we, we decided to expand our tentacles, not just to Nigeria alone, but focus on other African countries, you know, because the plight of, you know, Africans generally, it, it, it's, it's almost the same in terms of um, how government handle funds, how government deliberately excludes people, um, especially citizens from how they handle these funds. And just for more perspective, these funds is not government money. It's, it's actually people's money. So we felt, yes, we needed to start something that would drive um, this conversation across across Africa. And I think that's, that's how CTAP um, came together. Obviously, you know, it's a partnership between um, connected development and budget. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that. So from conception to date, yeah, I mean, it's been nine months since budget and code kickstarted this project in seven African countries. Now, what are the core steps that have been taken towards ensuring that the core objectives of this project are actualized. I mean, what would you say is the current progress right now and what needs to be done to make it better? All right, so uh, thank you very much once again for that question. And uh, so let me just start from uh, where we, from the basics, right? Which is uh, the old foundation for the work we've done so far is uh, data gathering, right? So basically, we need to understand how much was coming into each of our uh, African countries. We need to, we needed to also understand how much uh, funds were being spent by these countries in procurement of uh, emergency supplies uh, to support and to cater for our uh, COVID-19 needs in, in, in each of these countries. So uh, the first step, like I said, was to uh, dive into comprehensive data gathering. Which, is, which was a very tedious task, I must say, uh, basically because you're looking at all African countries and you're looking at all the funds that has gone into these countries, right? Just to understand the uh, ideology around and also to understand uh, the people who were funding and also why were they supporting uh, all of these African countries. So all of that, uh, we were able to do that and uh, that also helped us in building the website we have right now, which is which you can find uh, on the address of uh, www.covidfund.africa. That's one. So number two was the coalition building, right? Uh, we understood that uh, budget and code alone would not be able to get everything we needed, right? Uh, so we started building coalitions with other society organizations in Nigeria and also in all our uh, six other focused African countries, which is Ghana, 
Sierra Leone, Liberia, Malawi, Kenya, and Cameroon, uh, which is inclusive of Nigeria, obviously. So we understood that uh, we needed more people to be able to get our message across. And we also needed more people to make sure that uh, our voice has much weight when we are speaking out there. So that was number two thing we did. Number three thing we've done is to also now do a very comprehensive research. Uh, so this research work looked into uh, the, uh, uh, try to understand what the mechanisms of uh, actions were in all of these countries during the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. And also we tried to also understand what were the actions that were taken uh, to also forestall the activities uh, or the uh, backlash of uh, COVID-19 in all of these countries. Then also we looked at uh, the work of uh, other partners that were in these countries and how we could consolidate what they've done so far as well because we understood that uh, we needed more uh, knowledge, uh, most especially because we understood that some people were also on ground before we, we also joined. And the fourth thing we've also done was to also now disseminate information because we understood that we could do all of this work and uh, we needed people to share their human stories. We needed people to share their, uh, their pains. We needed to know how businesses were affected. And we also needed to now let people also understand how they can navigate these times because it was very, very unprecedented, right? So all of these things were the things we made sure we are able to uh, do to, to help us achieve the objectives we have. On the it's still ongoing. And uh, there are still some things we are still doing, uh, which is very uh, paramount to research and uh, coalition meetings. Thank you very much. Now, speaking about research, now in, in the document that was released, there were some corruption issues that were discovered. I mean, could you expand sheets more on this particular area, the corruption issues, and what step have you taken to address these issues? Yes, yes, there were corruption issues that were... Uh, they were they were discovered in all of these focus countries and uh, uh, for example in Malawi we've we've been even been able to go as far as sanctions to the people that were much more uh, involved in the uh, corrupt practices right but in all other countries what we've been able to do is uh, we've been able to raise awareness around uh, all of these issues right and trying to uh, seek for uh, more uh, transparency more accountability and also try to see how the law enforcement agencies can be much more empowered to actually do their work in forestalling these corrupt processes. Because uh, what we've discovered and as time went on was that uh, we can only raise the awareness on these issues, right? And uh, we can actually punish, right? But we can only uh, let the government understand what we see that is wrong, uh, that is going on in the system. In Liberia, we had uh, people uh, pocketing money that were meant for teachers into their private pocket. In, uh, in Syria alone, we had uh, issues around uh, the distribution of, uh, of uh, funding to, to local counties that were going into some personal pockets, right? So, and uh, all of these pocket of issues were all just around all of these African countries. And it just goes to show that uh, we are facing similar challenges when it comes to corruption, right? But uh, what, what can make us better? Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to see how we can uh, get uh, better even after these scenarios, right? Part of the coalition partners I was talking about, we have one of them uh, called Citizens Gavel. And uh, the work they've done, uh, and it relates very closely to this question, that's why I'm bringing them up right now. Uh, the work they've done was to see how, how we can have legal frameworks to actually prosecute these cases even across uh, all of these uh, focus countries that we've mentioned earlier. And we hope that uh, even after they, they are able to finalize their research work, we are able to present to respective governments uh, all this framework that we feel that uh, all these corrupt cases can be prosecuted under. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Yanu. Let's have Busayo on this one now. Having highlighted all of these corruption issues, what measures have been spared by the projects and to ensure transparency and accountability on the part of the government. Now, when it when it comes to when it comes to um, um, this 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 question, two things comes to mind. Uh, the first thing we're trying to do is to create an awareness, is to contextualize the issues, um, bring it to the front burner of, of major discussions, you know, across the country. And I think we've been able to significantly achieve that level of awareness with um, a bunch of the activities we've run um, from the research, from the data gatherings, the research, 
you know, to the project um, launch, to um, the various um, engagements we're having. And maybe I put it also in context. Uh, one of the things we're also doing uh, is to look at the state of primary health care, the primary health care system in the country. Because, uh, I mean, we remembered when the Secretary of State Government, who is in charge of the COVID-19, um, what is it called, the team, the national COVID-19 team, uh, he, he said on, on national TV that he didn't know that the health system in Nigeria was this bad. And one would probably feel like it's a... It's, 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 it's an indictment on the government that they do not understand the brevity of the gaps that we have, you know, currently in our system. So one of the things we try to do is we try to look into, you know, that, that um, space, the health, the health space. And obviously, um, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency has started with the responsibilities for, you know, vaccines and primary health. Now, if, if that critical component is as terrible as it is, and we've seen from the, 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 the data we, we gathered from 15 states in the country, that I mean, primary health is actually in a very deplorable state, then it, it shows that a whole lot more needs to be done from the perspective of government. And moving forward, we're engaging with um, the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, and we're also moving, looking at the various states across the countries. Um, health, primary healthcare development agency, and it's very, very deliberate to drive a narrative that hey, it's one thing for us to understand the problem, highlight the problem, um, put the flashlight on the problem, but we also have in the kitchen durable solutions that can ensure that for adventure we have a situation like this anytime in the next one, two, three, four, five, ten years. The government has a or an already re made response to tackle, you know, those kind of those kind of um, severe cases in, in a situation whereby um, we, we cannot, we don't even have the capacity to store vaccines, you know, in in the first place. So these are the kind of engagements that this project um, is seeking to have to ensure that we stimulate every part of the conversation from the transparency and accountability um, perspective to you know, the governance beats looking at uh, the governance of the primary healthcare, you know, agencies and all of those stuff. So, yes, yeah, so we, we intend to um, take up this uh, more in the second phase of the project because we're at the final lap, what the final lap of, of this project, the first phase of the project. In the second phase, we're looking at more institutional strengthening. And so what we've done in the first phase is to understand the context look into the gaps, look into the challenges, identify the challenges, like what Iyanu said, come up with frameworks, legislative frameworks. But you also know that as civil society organizations, we do not have the powers to persecute. So we still have to go back into advocacy and request for the right agencies of state, you know, to persecute those found wanting to have spent, you know, COVID funds, you know, arbitrarily. And, and maybe it's, it's also cool for us to put in perspective of the fact that of the fact that we we also we also may not because of the kind of audit system we run. So a typical example is what is happening in Cameroon, for example, where Cameroon a um, few months ago had its audit for 2020. You know, now looking at a, a situation like we have in Nigeria, where uh, our audit is is being um, reconciled in in a three years backward system, right? So what it means is this is 2021, you know, we're still looking at 2017 audits, right? It will take us probably a longer time if we do not create a structure with government to ensure that we audit immediately, you know, COVID funds and what it was used for in 2020, you know, so that the people that um, are found wanting will be brought to book and penalized because we believe that at the end of all what we're doing, People should be able to go to jail. I mean, people should be able to be punished for bad, you know, behavior because that, that that's going to serve like a punitive, you know, measure to check, you know, the the the, the reoccurrence of the same thing. The people that you know siphoned the flood money in 2012, you know, we've not seen anybody go to jail, right? So it even casts, you know, a a, a very funny look on the work we do. Uh, why do we invest so much in investigation? Why do we invest so much in tracking? 
when i mean we we obviously know we don't have the authorities to penalize you know those people caught in the web for corruption but these are these are these are piece and bits of what we're going to be doing in the next phase you know that requires high level engagement you know based on what we've been able to do on the first phase of this project so sorry you spoke about structure and framework for covid 19 accountability now, the budget earlier expressed concerns about the lack of a proper framework for COVID-19 fund accountability in Nigeria. Now, as of when the report, which is COVID-19 fund, fiscal support, palliative analysis, and institutional response. As of when this report was filed, comprehensive details of disbursed funds have not been published on the Open Treasury platform. So between then and now, what has changed? I mean, have the government taking any move to address these issues? Now, now, just like every other thing in the country, you know, we, we even when we have frameworks of blueprint, it's not followed to the best. I, I give you, I give you guys a typical example. When COVID-19 hit and when there was a, a lockdown, one of the first things we did at Code was to host a webinar with um, the Bureau of Public Procurement, brought in our friends from Serap, and brought in friends from PPDC, uh, procurement monitors, you know, brought in the, the, the ICPC and EFCC. Unfortunately, I mean, they didn't want to speak, but they were at the, the webinar, and it was it was clearly focused on, you know, coming up the the the, the um, procurement bureau of public procurement coming up on a clear cut emergency procurement um, system, right? Because we discovered that according to the law that created. Um, uh, what is it called? Um, the the Bureau of Public Procurement. Now, according to their law, there is there's a part that speaks to procurement in an emergency. But as at the time when we had this webinar, I, I can say to you guys and I, all of us, we all know that there was no framework like that. That part of the the the, the law wasn't brought into you know into existence. You know, and it shows that, that most times. You know, a whole lot of these guys we have in government do not even know what they are doing there in the first place. When we pointed them to this, I, within 48 hours, you know, the Bureau of Public Procurement, you know, um, um, published, you know, procurement in an emergency. And maybe I just push this forward that, you know, when, so so on, on the emergency procurement, immediately after the emergency, what is supposed to happen is that, you know, all the procurements that had happened during the emergency, you know, should be published, right? Now, in the context of COVID-19, these were health procurements, right? So you could hear people talk about ventilators. We could hear people talk about, you know, COVID supplies. Um, you could hear people talk about PPEs and all of those stuff. Till tomorrow, till tomorrow, go back to the Nokopo website, you would not see any of these informations there. So most times it's not about a framework. Even when the framework is in existence, it is the follow-up of that framework by the institution of state required to follow up, right? They don't do that. I mean, we can have millions and billions of frameworks or blueprints without actively using those things. We would come back to square zero, right? So, so yes, it's great. We're definitely going to share these frameworks we've been able to develop with government and we're doing that already. But what would happen from that point is the political will of the state, the political will of government to be able to use these frameworks or even give it to them, added to their own frameworks, you know, um, so that we can see that level of transparency and accountability we need. But I mean, your guess is as good as mine. We may come back to have this discussion, you know, probably at the second phase you know, at the end of the second phase of this project, and I'm not sure too many things, you know, would have changed. Now, so my, my position is, without the right political will, without the right political interest to drive these levels of change and social accountability we want to see, efforts of guys like us in the space would continually be theoretical, right? Because we do not have the power of the states, for example, to persecute. So when we find people that have done wrong, we can't do anything to them. We probably petition the EFCC, the ICPC, but the same guys will tell you that they have other more important things to, you know, to go about, and which is, which is a shame, by the way. But we hope that 
when we engage citizens enough and citizens bring these issues to the front burner, it would probably set a perspective for government at all levels, you know, to begin to see the need, emphasis on the need to run with these recommendations, you know, we get from citizens. So with a lack of political will, like you mentioned, what, how would you rate the level of compliance on the parts of the government? Are they making efforts? So, so f because I don't, I don't have, I don't have the data to back this. And I'm just speaking for myself. So, if you want to quote, I mean, just quote me besides speaking for himself. I, I think we've performed poorly, and we didn't just start today. It's, it's been a constant poor performance. You know, when it comes to accountability, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to physical accountability. And even physical responsibility. It's, 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 it's the same. It's, it's the same way we behaved in 2012 and the crisis before then. You know, till how we're behaving now. Nothing has significantly changed. What probably may have changed is citizens' awareness because hey, there's more citizens' awareness now. I mean, CSOs are, are beginning to collaborate to do great stuff. The CETA project, for example, is bringing about you know people from. You know the legal, the legal part. Those of us who are on the field tracking, those of us who are big on governance and all, it's bringing everybody together. So we're beginning to speak in in a single voice, which is good. You understand, but we've not been able to translate that. You know, to impress on the people in government. You know, so the fact that we're still lagging behind in this, and the fact that government has refused to take responsibility. You know, for this, I would boldly say that we're performing very poorly. Okay, so let's 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 have Iano here. Let's let's bring Iano at this point. Now, Iano, during the project, I mean, you guys visited these focus countries. You went to several of them, including Nigeria. What was your experience like? Your field experience? All right. So, uh, basically, uh, the major problem that we see across almost all all the part of the African countries we've been to is a uh, lack of information, right? The access to information is very, very restricted, right? And uh, this is a big challenge. And the reason is because, uh, you know, there's a lot of things they don't want to get to the public. And uh, there's a lot of uh, information, the few that uh, might raise a lot of questions, even from the general public, right? So the, the access to information has been very, very restricted, right? And also, uh, when we did uh, country-level tracking, we realized that a lot of things that uh, the government claimed to have provided for the people, uh, using uh, palliative as an example, uh, was very, very, very low, uh, as, as, as expected uh, to have catered for people, right? It fell beyond expectations. And uh, what we also see uh, from, as a challenge uh, from the from the field across Africa was that the uh, level of education to people uh, to understand the effect of this virus uh, was actually also very low. So a lot of people were just on lockdown, uh, not having full understanding around what are the things they need to do to protect themselves, what are the things they need to also do to keep themselves updated and all of that, right? Uh, we saw that as, as a challenge. Uh, we also saw the, uh, the uh, there's a, there was an apathy uh, around across Africa uh, as towards citizens, towards the government. And uh, you will see that that simply stemmed from uh, the previous uh, experience citizens have had with the government, really, because uh, a lot of people just did not believe uh, the government's uh, words anymore, right? So there was a lot of uh, people just uh, uh, following up to whatever that come to their own mind and not just following the instructions that were given by the government, right? So we saw that also as a challenge. And uh, the, the one of the biggest challenge we also saw was uh, all the test statements were not released, right? Uh, for, 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 for Sierra Leone, for example, Sierra Leone only gave us an unaudited statement of report. Nigeria has not released the audited statement of report. And, you know, so it gives us very little or no information at all towards knowing how much exactly was spent, uh, what exactly was bought, and if the value for money was actually gotten at the end of the day, right? So all of these were a series of challenges that we faced across all, all these uh, focused countries. It was it ranged from a uh, lack of uh, access to information, uh, apathy from the citizens. Uh, number three was uh, the uh, lack or no presence of the government at all uh, in some places. 
and number four is a uh, lack of transparency and accountability amidst uh, the government and agencies that are responsible for that. So still on ERO, as part of the efforts, as part of the measures being taken to see that the core objective of the project is actualized, you mentioned the launch of the CTAB website, right? Now, regarding this website, would you say citizens are fully aware of the website, you know, of its functionalities and its purpose generally? All right. So, uh, so we've, uh, so I would say, I would say partially because you know that we still need to continue uh, this information out there because, like I said, we've seen a great number of uh, citizens are party towards anything that has to do with transparency and accountability because, at the end of the day, they believe that nothing actually comes out of it but uh, we need to continuously and consistently change their mind towards that but uh what we've seen and uh, what we've done is uh we've seen that a lot of uh media houses have picked up on the website some of them have used information from the website so i believe uh, we want to also agree to say that that has also helped to uh, push the website we've done a website launch right uh we've done that as well we believe that that was also helped because we've seen uh, the publications in both local local and international media and uh, we have also been able to see people use some resources from the website so yes uh it's gonna it's not where we want it to be yet uh but we are going to continue pushing it and make sure that uh it's as uh, informative as possible and also it's uh relevant to the information people are willing to also lay their hands on as time goes on. The final question, let's have Busayo on this one. Now, Busayo, how can citizens best contribute to the process to ensure and demand transparency and accountability from the government? Would you say that citizens are doing enough? Uh, I, I mean, I mean, um, we, cannot, we cannot say citizens are doing enough because we ourselves are not doing enough. But I think, I think idealistically, we need to look at... Um, the larger civil society. And when I say this, uh, I don't intend to be ambiguous. I, I, maybe I should clear this, right? There's a difference between the organized civil society, that's the civil society organizations like Code, Budget, you know, Citizens Cavalry, the organized civil society. I, I think that there's a need to, I think that we, because of the kind of work we do, the importance of the work we do, we probably have gotten to a point where we're beginning to feel like we can solve the problems of, of, of everyone. No, we can't. We, we actually can't. I think there's a need for us to decentralize our engagement, you know, so much so that the larger civil society, I'm talking about the everyday Nigerians, I'm talking about the people who wake up and go to work experience, bad roads experience, you know, crazy traffic experience, very sick and saddening realities of the Nigerian state should be deliberately brought into the tough, you know, to, to begin to drive these conversations. I think we need more, you know, citizens led in the actual sense of citizen led and not, um, not NGO, um, sp um, what was the word, not, not NGO controlled, purely citizens led so that maybe, just maybe, if we can get the critical mass of people engaging, government will listen more. And I, and I give you instances where this has worked. Look at the NSAS protest. The NSAS protest wasn't a derivative of any civil society organization. It was clearly the movement of people who were tired about the situation. And we saw the impact it made, even though it was cuttled by the government. I think we need more of those kind of um, citizens drive you know that can that can become holistic because everyone is going to be united in their sufferings united in their pains you understand there's nothing there's nobody you need to submit a report to right you're doing what you need to do because you understand that it connects with you directly until we get to this point what would keep on seeing is what civil society organizations are trying to do which is not bad you know but you know, I think it's, 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 not, it's not organic, you know, enough. And, and that's why I said I'm going to be very idealistic. You know, I don't know, I don't understand how this is going to be practical, but I can give an inference to the NSAS protest on how organic, you know, that protest grew, even so much so that the regular voices, you know, were, were not the voices you heard. You know, unfortunately, that protest has brought in new voices 
and those new voices has formed organizations also. But I think the coordinated civil society organizations are limited. We must ensure that the people, the citizens, the people who feel the pains, the brunt of the Nigerian state, yes, we feel it too, but there are some people that feel it more. We must ensure that those people are the ones who come to the top, you know, to begin to create these deliberate conversations. Now we, we must also marshal that to ensure that it reflects in the election area so that the right kind of people would emerge, you know, because of the citizens, you know, um, disgust of the guys in the system. Now it is easy for the citizens because they have the numbers, you know, to probably get the right quote unquote kind of people in government. And I think until we get to that point, you know, then we can actually, you know, all the sense of actuality, you know, um, boldly beat our chest to know that we have started the process, you know, of, 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 of mobilizing citizens and mass and citizens are playing the kind of roles they're supposed to play within the system. Okay, thank you for that. So, Ianu, do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to add to this, Matthew? All right, so, okay, uh, well, I, what I would just add basically is that we need to raise our voice more and uh, we need to ask questions because uh, I, I remember that I have answered this question once and uh, what I said the other day was that as citizens, we need to we need to understand that it is not them versus us. It is us citizens demanding for transparency and accountability from our representatives, right? Uh, until we understand the circle of governance and we also understand that all uh, of our decisions have consequences, even as citizens, uh, we would not understand the impact or, or, or our disinterest, what it, what it actually does to us in demanding our uh, transparency and accountability. So uh, basically my own advice would just be that we need to uh, demand questions uh, from, we need to demand uh, uh, transparency and accountability. We need to ask questions, right? You need to write that letter. You need to write that FOI. You need to uh, ask a question from your representative. You need to speak to your counselor. You need to speak to your chairman. You need to speak to your governor, right? They are all representing you at each level that they find themselves. And we must also understand that as citizens, uh, we have the voice to either keep them there or uh, take them out of that position and we must uh, not hesitate to use uh, our civic uh, rights uh, to make sure that we pursue uh, transparency and accountability uh, for the whole country. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Steps have been taken, but there is room for more on the part of the government and on the part of the citizens. That's it for this particular episode. Thank you for joining us. We have Bosayo Marakinio. He is the Community Engagement Director for Connected Development. We equally had Iyanulua Bonarima, the Senior Program Officer with Budget. Don't forget to send in your comments, observations, and contributions via Twitter on our Twitter page, it's Budget NG, on Facebook, it's Budget NG, and on Instagram, it's also Budget NG. My name is Nancy Odimego. Until next time, would you join us again? Okay.